Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Club Moffat Talks. I guess that's what we're calling it at this point. I'm Chris. I, I'm Ryan. I'm Courtney. Just Courtney. I'm the special <laughs> guest. <laughs> Courtney is our interim director right now. She's making sure the ship is still on course, keeping us all um, afloat. And the reason Courtney is on today is because Courtney did a request for us. We were asking people what they'd like to hear, and Courtney gave a request for us to do a uh, to touch upon a topic. And then Chris said, "Well, if they do a request, they have to show up on the show." So that's why yeah. We we pulled the rug right out from under you. Ha ha. <laughs> yeah, this will be the last time I make a request. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you that's remember what the request true. was that she made? Are you asking me? Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, you guys talked about it in um, the podcast where you talked about the horror films and the movies or the books. You started talking about the origin of some sane. And I enjoyed that and thought it would be interesting to hear more of those kinds of things. So that was my request. Okay. Right, you know that's kind of how that's that's just kind of how speech evolves naturally. That's kind of how we get more modern languages is just the way that like certain phrases become part of our lexicon over time and that's how languages work for forever. So it is interesting to see just how how phrases can help language evolve over time. And entomology has always been a, a fascinating subject that I actually, whenever I come across a word, the first thing I do is I go look it up, see where it came from. I mean, it's just something I do. Yeah. Um, I know it's kind of weird, but it's just something I've always been involved with. I love, and back when I was over by the uh, the reference section, I used to run over and grab the Oxford English Dictionary all the time to look <laughs> stuff up. It, it, I just find it fascinating. And now you can do that with a, with a quick Google search. Google yeah. search. Which is actually what I did today. Uh, I was I was kind of racking my brain for some favorite um, some favorite sayings that I have, and I found a really good history.com article that's ten common sayings with historical origins. And even then, most of these I'm looking at and thinking, "Wow, I never even considered that." Except for there's one which you pointed out, Ryan, which is resting on your laurels. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what where that saying came from, but it's, a, it's kind of incredible how these all have actual historic mm -hmm. precedents for, for every single one of them. Well, I do the resting on the laurels one. Constantly. I don't know that one. You want, you want to go ahead and tell her what the origin of that one is, Chris? Yeah, sure. Resting on your laurels. Uh, it dates back to leaders and athletic stars of ancient Greece. So this is a, a very old saying. In Hellenic times, laurel leaves were closely tied to Apollo, the god of music, prophecy, and poetry. Apollo was usually depicted with a crown of laurel leaves, and the plant eventually became a symbol of status and achievement. I'm just reading this straight off the website, by the way. That's what most of what we do here at the library. We impart <laughs> wisdom based on what we've read somewhere else. We, we plagiarize is what we do, apparently. Okay. <laughs> we don't do that. Like, no, don't do you that. just cite your sources and you're okay. Yes, please. If you would like to know how to uh, cite references for your papers, please come by and, uh, and, <laughs> and give us a question. We, we would love to answer that for you. Um, victorious athletes at the ancient Pythian Games. Is it Pythian or Pythian? I don't know. I don't either. Uh, but whatever games they were, the victorious athletes received wreaths made of laurel branches, and the Romans later adopted the practice and presented wreaths to generals who won important battles. Venerable Greeks and Romans, or laureates, you know, like like Nobel laureates or mm -hmm. poet laureates, you know, that's where that saying comes from, were thus able to rest on their laurels by basking in the glory of past achievements. Only later did the phrase take on a negative connotation, and since the, the 1800s it has been used for those who are overly satisfied with past triumphs. Yeah, um... Again, if you've ever watched, seen like some of the busts of Caesar, he'll have the, the the kind of crown of laurel leaves and things like that. Or um, in the early Olympics, they used to crown the the winners uh, with with a crown of laurel leaves and stuff like that. So yeah, it's kind of incredible how that how that became a negative thing. Like you're like almost like pride goes before the fall. You know, like this is this is something you should be proud of, but you're it, it makes you look lazy almost. Even well, though you've achieved something. I will follow that up with Courtney. Yes. Do you know 
if, if, if I was to call you about a thousand years ago or about 800 years ago, if I was to call you a sinister villain, do you know what that would mean? It means something different back then than it does now. Really? Yeah. Was it something good back then? Well, what do you think? Do you have any idea? Do you have any guesses? Well, if it means something different because now it would be not good, I would I would guess that it was positive. The term sinister villain, if I was to call you that, say, in the 14th century, would mean I was calling you a left-handed farmer. <laughs> a what? A left-handed farmer. <laughs> I, the what? word that sinister so means left-handed. The word, the word villain comes from the same word as, as villa or villager. It means someone who, who's, who's a farmhand, basically. So, again, if I was to call you a, a sinister villain, all it would mean is I'm calling you, oh, that's a left-handed farmer. But because of our, again, as you say, the negative connotations, the idea of someone being left-handed meant they were clumsy, that they were wrong. Again, the word right means correct. And it actually originally meant r left and right, but over time it meant correct. Oh, he's right-handed. He is correct. So the word sinister became the opposite of that. Oh, if he is sinister, then he is incorrect. He is wrong. There's something wrong with him. Huh. Um, and it became, became also the idea of the, of the left head path was the path of Satan and 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 the devil. So it became it, it gained sinister connotations to some extent. And the word villain it was it became an insult after a while. Oh, you farmhand. Oh, you. Oh, and then it became somebody who was actually actively evil and stuff like that. So it's interesting to see that these terms, as you were saying, developed not negative connotations. The original connotations weren't necessarily negative. They were kind of neutral. It was just describing someone as a left-handed villain. But because of our biases in our society, if someone is a um, from a lower class, they're evil. If someone is left-handed, they're evil. So just remember that. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, you know, that's that's really kind of fascinating. You brought this up to me yesterday, I believe. And I've had this... Uh, this discussion with a friend of mine who was left-handed and he was uh, heavily uh, enforced to change that to be right-handed. And he, he said it actually caused some like development issues because he basically had to hardwire his brain to act differently because being left-handed, like there's, there's like, I don't know, superstition around it, and he's from the same place I am, where everyone is superstitious, so it's it's really fascinating that something like that still persists. But you brought up something, actually this has nothing to do with, with our topic, but you're talking about left hand and right hand path. I kind of mm -hmm. wanted to just to touch on that briefly, in case anyone doesn't know. Uh, from Wikipedia, uh, in Western SO... Uh, esotericism, the left hand and right hand path are the dichotomy between two op opposing approaches to magic. The terminology is used in various groups involved in the occult and ceremonial magic. In some definitions, the left hand path is equated with malicious black magic or black shamanism, where the right hand path with benevolent magic. Uh, there's some other stuff about the tree of knowledge and the tree of life, but it's um, that's a very, as they say, it's a very esoteric definition. Would you say it's sinister? I would say that <laughs> left-handed path is sinister in, in all aspects of the word. It is uh, straight up very, uh, very much in the realm of black magic. Yeah. What about politics? <laughs> politics. Oh. Politics uh, comes from the Greek polis, meaning the people. Um, and but tick, which left, is a blood-sucking verb. The right. Oh, I'm just thinking right now with the election. Oh, I know the answer to that one. Uh, okay. You mean you mean, you mean, uh, you mean a right wing and left wing? Yeah. That comes from the French Revolution. Okay. Oh, that's right. They, this, the, when they developed the uh, the French Parliament, I don't think the French Diet. I forget which one it's called. Uh, basically, um, the extreme members of it would sit to the far right and to the far left of the uh, of the assembly, basically. Yeah. And so that's where that word comes from. It actually, it was literally, if you were far right, then that means you were sitting way over there. If you were far left, you were sitting way over there because the extremists wanted to be nowhere near each other. Okay. So that's where that word comes from is the fact that um, in the, uh, again, I think it was the Diet uh, uh, Assembly, uh, the, the, the extreme um, revolutionaries from the left side and the right side were, were literally on the left side and the right side. Well, Fascinating. Well, Diet is a, that's a German word. Uh, I, I see that word a lot uh, with 
Japanese politics because they use the same concept. It's basically it's just parliament, but yeah. it, the German word is where the the origin of that entire concept comes from. But I didn't know if the French word the French use uh, which term they used for the assembly, the legislative assembly. I'm not going to look that one up on the podcast. I'm going to leave that up to the listeners. Okay. I have another word as well that I think is fascinating. Okay. Uh, Courtney, do you know where the word okay comes from? Oh. Ooh. Well, it's an abbreviation, isn't it? Uh, it could be. Okay, no. okay, no, I don't know. That's okay, because most people don't know either. Uh, I can talk a little bit about where it first showed up in the English language, but there is a lot of controversy over what its actual origin is. Uh, it's if you, The first place it showed up was was a meme. What? We think we think of memes as this brand new idea. It's really not. It is not. It's a very old idea. Memes have been around forever. This was something that was going on on the East Coast, um, around Boston and stuff like that. It, it would, in various forms of literature, various publications, newspapers, magazines, they started basically making memes. They started making jokes. And the jokes were the fact that they would uh, misspell things. It's basically the 19th century equivalent of can I has cheeseburger or something along those lines, you know? It's, <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> so the predecessor of OK was OW, which stood for all right, but it oh. was misspelled. So the idea was somebody saying all right, but they're misspelling it, so it's not all right. Ah. And so sure. the term OK came from all correct. Again, they were misspelling it with an O and a K, Instead of instead of an A and a C, <clears throat> and so it became a joke of the idea that someone's saying all correct when they're misspelling it, it's not correct at all, and it became like a joke idea. Also around that time, abbreviating things became really popular. Um, for example, in, in Boston, you could see the abbreviation JT. People would write something out, and he goes, "I'm so upset about this JT." It's kind of like YOLO nowadays. You know, you only live once, or some of the other abbreviations. Well, JT meant gone to Texas. Because what? at that time, Texas was an independent, um, this was done during the 1830s, uh, Texas was an independent nation, and a lot of people were leaving the United States to go to Texas. If they were fed up with politics, or if they were fed up with how things were going, or they weren't having success, they'd say, JT, meaning I've gone to Texas. Back when so, the word gone was spelled with a J. Um, that was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Well, anyway, Courtney, is there a phrase that you're that you're I'm rather not fond of? I'm, not finished. I'm still going. I'm still. Oh going no! To the tail. There's more to the tail. <laughs> um, so the idea of, of just doing okay meant that it, you were basically saying all correct. It was like a little thing, like a little hashtag almost. You could stick at the end of your end of your your thing saying okay, and it's a joke saying everything's correct or everything's okay, but I'm being funny about it. What hmm. happened is in, in, also in the 1840 election, Martin Van Buren was up for um, was up for re-election. And his nickname was old, hold on a second, let me get this correct. His uh, nickname was Old Kinderhook, because he was from Kinderhook, New York. Oh, weird. So his slogans were, vote for OK. Well, one of the things that the, um, the Whigs, who were the opposite party back then, because again, the, the Republicans didn't exist yet, um, what they did is they seized upon, they go, oh my God, he called himself OK. Doesn't he know that's a joke, that, that it's basically somebody who's an idiot who can't spell correctly? And so <laughs> they seized upon that, and they played around with it. And, and, and because it was a national campaign, this, this East Coast kind of jokey way of the describing things became a national uh, uh, type word. And that's when it reached its broad, uh, broad appeal across the entire United States. The idea of saying OK to mean everything's all right, everything's correct, everything is uh, is, is, um, is good, things of that nature. You were going to say Hunky Dory. Which I was going to say Hunky Dory. But which I, is one of my favorite albums, just as a side note. And I will point out one final thing about OK. Um, OK also became very popular during World War II because when you had radio, people on the radio, that's when radio was first used in war and stuff like that, you wanted to make sure that what you were saying wasn't misconstrued or misheard. That's why, for example, you hear military people always say affirmative instead of saying yes, because yes can be misheard. It's a very brief um, uh, word. <laughs> saying something like affirmative is, is much more, okay, I understood what you said. They begin using the terms A-OK -A or OK as well to, to mean everything's, everything's fine, everything's working correctly. It became a term that they used more and more <laughs> often. 
that caught on because of World War II, because the United States was in so many different places. They were in, you know, they were in Germany after the war. They were in Japan after the war. They were in the South Pacific. They were in Burma. They were in Europe. They were in England and stuff like that. The term OK became popular around the world. And today, the word OK is in so many languages, is the most widely used word in the world. Because I was just OK at that is actual, an actual word. It's been borrowed by so many other languages. You can say OK in Japan and everyone knows exactly what you're talking about, for example. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it's, so it's, it's interesting that this word that we have actually don't really know where it comes from, where it came from a joke, is now the most widely used word in the world. So who decided, so it started as OK, then mm -hmm. who decided the proper way to, to say it or spell it was OKAY? I, I don't know. It's probably just somebody spelling it out. They try yeah. to make it more official? Yeah. If, if you look at this one, I, I'm on, I think it's, OK, it's indifferentlanguages.com. And it's, it's straight up like Danish, Dutch, Estonian, Finnish. Uh, Frisian, Galician, Hungarian, Luxembourgish, uh, Maltese, Portuguese, it's all it's all the same thing, but it's it, depending on their language, like OK in Danish is spelled the same. OK in Dutch is OKE. Estonian and Finnish, it's OKEI. It's literally just how you phonetically would say it in that language. Hmm. Yeah, that's and to answer That's your question, I can't answer it right now, but I could run over to the Oxford English Dictionary, pull that out, and tell you where the word OK, O-K-A-Y first appears in the English language. OK, you can tell me later. OK, I don't know <laughs> off the top of my head. <laughs> there is a word that I want to kind of shine a spotlight on, and it's one that you've used before, and that is the word meme. Ah, OK. Now, a meme, the, the actual word came about in the 70s from Richard Dawkins. Uh, the meme is, it's basically just a, it's something that evolves through language. Uh, from Wikipedia, the term refers to any cultural entity that an observer might consider a replicator. And, and that just means that it's something that is replicated throughout culture. It's a unit of cultural transmission or a unit of imitation and replication but later definitions would vary. Now we have, you know, memes just kind of refer to an internet joke, but it's still in the same context. The the internet meme is literally spread by other transformative. Not quite in the same way that a meme like like a really huge cultural definition would would originally have you believe. And in fact, one of the the historical ways that I've seen it is also mentioned here. It's it's almost like the DNA of a culture, like the way that that genetics pass on through you know, through replication through new generations. It's that same thing only through thoughts and images and, and ideas. So even that word which is only, what, 54, 44 years old at this point, has become its own thing that's almost entirely separate from how it was originally. Yeah, now it's about cats on the internet. Which, which makes it far better. <laughs> Courtney, well, I think that's any... the end of the segment, Courtney. Thank you for being with us. Um, this was kind of fun. I think we might do this in the future. Absolutely. See if anyone here in the building or campus wants, to, wants, to have it, wants us to talk about something, and we'll talk about it for a little bit. Do you have any pet phrases that you particularly enjoy? I I don't I don't think so, but I always like I hear people say stuff or I'll say something just out of habit and I wonder where it came from. And I will say just go Google it. <laughs> I will say this. Um, Courtney brought this up that she wants to talk about that. And there is a couple of um, scholars on this on this on this subject that have their own podcast. That's in the thousands upon thousands of podcasts now, which is Away With Words, which is a fantastic podcast. If anyone's really interested in this, we probably won't touch upon the subject again. We might come back to it once in a while. But if you want, if that's the sort of thing you love, I can recommend a podcast called Away With Words. There you go. Away With Words. <laughs> okay. Thank you for joining us, Courtney. Thanks for having me. Bye. Bye. So one of my favorite 
phrases actually is crocodile tears because I like using it. It's it's such a it's not exactly derogatory, but it is like it's pointed. Yeah. Because you can say it and people know exactly what you're what you mean by that. Um it is from history.com. Uh Crocodile Tears describes a display of superficial or false sorrow, but the saying actually derives from a medieval belief that crocodiles shed tears of sadness while they killed and consumed their prey, which they don't because crocodiles do not feel anything. They are horrible murderers. Uh, the myth dates back as far as the 14th century. But it's fun to, to just identify, like, these are crocodile tears. I know it. I don't believe what I'm seeing right now. And for those of our listeners who have reptiles at home or raise crocodiles, um, uh, the views of of, of, of Chris Stepanet <laughs> do not reflect that of, of the library or the MSU in general. I will point yeah. out there are people who raise crocodiles and they they, oh, they right. enjoy crocodiles and 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 there are there's this old idea that reptiles and lizards are horrible things that don't feel anything, which has been proven not to be true. I mean, they're they're just as good a pet as uh, as as other uh, other types of pets that people have. Would you call that? A meme? No. Oh. Uh, yeah, my dad had a... I don't think it was an... It wasn't a, a, an iguana. Maybe it was. The ones that have the weird toes. Where the, the middle one's, like, super long. can't remember if that's... Which one that is. But all I remember is that it had a really crooked tail. I think it was a rescue or something. But it was cool. He was really chill. My father also had a lizard that he captured somewhere in rural Nebraska and tried to raise. Interesting. <laughs> well, there weren't really exotic pet uh, pet stores back in the in the in the 1950s. That's all. That's that's true. We've hit the point in the podcast now where we are both tired. I think it's also a Friday. <laughs> it's also a Friday, and I I am more than than ready to just go to sleep ah but, but this this is this is the 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 light banter and small talk portion of, of our of our uh of our podcast though chris which it is slowly becoming the main focus of which i'm fine with i'm very much a uh a small talker oh you know what i forgot to ask courtney about her what she's reading or watching this week that's what it was ah ah should well, we be the first thing we're, we we're reading or watching this week, if you want. What are you reading slash watching slash video game playing this week? This week? Um, well, if you brought it up, I've actually been watching a series of videos on YouTube with a guy who rescues reptiles, which is why I brought the reptile thing, which oh, I just right. found interesting and fascinating. I always like those videos. They're so heartwarming. Or they like are. the Dodo. It, and again, I, I, it changed my appreciation of, of of reptiles. I mean, he has a little monitor lizard that he plays basically plays fetch, which was, was just endearing. Um, you know, it, 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 it's 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 the fact that it's that's a small reptile and not a small dog is is kind of unbelievable because it acts just like a small dog when he's playing with its with, the, with its ball with it. He was like, "Give it to me! Give me the ball! Give me the ball! Give me! It. Come on! Come on! Come on!" And the reptiles, you know, shaking it and, and playing with it and stuff is just really, it was heartwarming. And the, what I, we, we've talked about this a little bit before, but um, really what it is that, that makes lizards kind of appear to be less pet worthy, I guess, is just because of like the way they express emotion. Mm -hmm. My, my mom raises dogs and every single one of them, I, they're super happy and they actually smile. They get big dimples and they have big wide friendly eyes. And uh, my cat's evil, but she also <laughs> smiles. She has big friendly eyes. And that's the way, you know, the, as the saying goes to bring this all back around, the eyes are the window to the soul. So having the, having lizards who look like they're constantly frowning and don't really have those, those big friendly smiles. I think maybe that, just because humans are so pattern focused, we kind of associate that type of expression with friendliness when it's not really the case. It's more of, of how things act towards you and how you interact with them. You know, that's the most important thing. But for us, humans are shallow creatures. We don't like to admit it, but just seeing a smile is enough to kind of disarm us. 
Well, I'd say also it's a little hardwired into us. I mean, also that's the reason we um, we react so much to puppies and kittens because we're kind of hardwired to protect small young creatures. Plus, they're clumsy and stupid, so <laughs> we also love them. But yeah, that's that's part of you know we. It's been a few hundred thousand years, but we are still just mammals. We're just, we're animals. We like to identify when things are being friendly with us. We can't like, we can't say like, I smell friendly pheromones out right now. I'm just going to assume that this person is, is uh, friendly to me. Instead, we kind of identify it by expression and, and interaction. But it's still no less of a sort of animalistic thing. Again, it's 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 we react well. Again, it's it's also the, the someone brought up the fact that um, I saw this. It was a joke, but it was like save the ugly animals. The <laughs> fact that um, we're so interested in saving the cute animals, we we tend to forget about the ugly ones um, somewhat. I think I had to do with sharks or something like that. Like for instance, sharks are almost there's a lot of shark species that are extinct just because we view them as horrible, terrible creatures. Same thing with snakes. There's a lot of rattlesnake species that are endangered because people just think, oh, they're evil. We need to kill them. So Yeah, and that's one thing that I, now that you brought it up, please do not touch snakes. If you see them in, in the wild, don't just say, I need to kill this snake. Unless it's like in your, unless you're a farmer and there is a snake in your chicken coop or something, just leave them alone. Uh, and, and that same goes with sharks, too. I saw a video the other day of someone deep sea diving. I, I guess they were um, researching or something. They were checking out the, the ocean floor. And you can see from, like, stage right on the on the footage, this relatively big shark comes in and, like, bonks the diver's head. And they both get disoriented and kind of, like, float for a little bit while they try to get their bearings straight. I don't think that the shark was outright trying to be goofy, but it's a matter of if animals like that were as vicious and horrible as like media portrays them to be, that video would have probably not been on the internet. I gotcha. Yeah. Well, also people kind of um, don't understand what things are actually very dangerous to humans. I mean, it's, it's it, the most dangerous animal in, uh, in, in, in Africa, for example, is not is not the is not the lion. It's not uh, you know it's not some it's not the leopard. It's not some great predator. It's it's the hippo. Mm. <laughs> Hippos are terrifying. I don't uh, know. Same same sort of thing with I mean uh, dogs are uh, wild wild feral dogs are more dangerous than than <laughs> for example like a puma or something like that. Most predators have learned not to attack humans. Um, they, yeah, they've, they've they've learned that attacking humans is bad. Um, bad things happen. So again, we don't. Whenever, whenever there is like a puma attack, whenever there is a shark attack, or whenever there is a uh, um, some sort of predator attack, usually it, it, it receives huge headlines, and people are always scared about it and stuff like that. The truth of the matter, it's usually a mistake. Usually, that predator mistook the human for something else, um, or it was starving, or something along those lines. Uh, predator attacks on humans are actually very rare. That reminds me of that of the the video at this point. It's like a month old, so it might as well be ancient. But it's a video that's big right now of a uh, a mountain lion, I believe, that's trying to intimidate a human. And the video is just, it's this thing like kicking up dirt, and its it's got this really intimidating pose to it. But it, the video goes on for a long time where it's just trying to like bat away this person. And as more footage came out and, and people dug into it a little more, the guy was straight up in its territory going, Oh, oh stupid Puma or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Or Okay. It wasn't that it wasn't that bad, but he was apparently intimidating it by, by all metrics of the internet. So it, it, an animal like that, like you said, it's just trying to protect itself. It's not like trying to outright viciously attack a human. It's like, this is my home. Get out. I don't like people being in my home. Uh, whenever, whenever I invite uh, night manager Philip over the entire time, I'm doing that same thing. You know, I'm kicking up dirt. I'm making cat <laughs> noises. I'm trying to get them out of my house. Trying to make yourself look better than there. you really are. Gotcha. Yeah. 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 And I'm a, you know, it's weird. I, I say that I'm a, a not a tall dude, but 
I guess it's just in comparison. He's a, a hulking figure. But yes, I try to make myself tall. Well, let's move on from there. Um, yeah, please. With, with all due haste. Is there anything coming up that we want to talk about? Obviously, Thanksgiving's coming up. Uh, um, what are you doing for Thanksgiving? Generally, what happens in my house, though, is my parents come to visit me on Thanksgiving, and I go to visit them on Christmas. We reversed it last year, and we both decided that was the wrong thing to do, so we're probably going back to the old way, which means my parents are coming down to visit me for Thanksgiving, and I'll probably be going to visit my parents on Christmas. Well, that's good. I'm probably not going out anywhere this year. I, we don't go out on Thanksgiving anyway. My wife works. Uh, Black Friday is not so fun for her. Uh, it's not going to be any fun for me this year, definitely. Um, we're, we're just going to stay in. Her parents usually come. I don't know what we're going to do for Christmas. Um, at this point, I don't know what it's going to look like when this podcast comes out, but our town is... I don't think it's doing so hot with the COVID outbreak. Uh, I certainly don't want to go out right now. It's it's not looking so hot. But uh, by the time Christmas rolls around, I'm fairly positive things are going to get... Um, I don't want to say worse because I don't want people to, to get negative thoughts or feelings about it. But it's not going to be too much better. Especially with flu season around the corner. So I don't know what I'm going to do. I got gotcha. you. Um, I'm not going to add to that. Um, I'm going to change the subject. Yes. Uh, <laughs> let's let's do another hard shift to the right. Yeah. This might be a short one. This is probably going to be a short podcast. Uh, I am. I'm not really reading anything now. I have this problem, and it get it gets bad when I get stressed. And right now, I'm about as stressed as I possibly can be. Where I'll I'll put my effort into like three or four things. And I can't concentrate on any of them, so I it ends up being just like I'm going to turn this one thing on for stress relief, and it's it's not going to be very fruitful, but it is what it is. It's there just just in case. Um, I'm still reading Dune. That's going slowly. I haven't really made much headway into it recently. I'm playing two video games, um, kind of mainly right now there's some others that i'm that i'm poking at but these two that are my primary stress relief um and i play them both in bed because they're on the switch uh the first is dragon quest 11 which is a kind of a it's a new game but it's kind of a classical style uh role-playing game the other is Baldur's gate which is very much a classic game that's been reconfigured to to play on more than just a computer. For the longest time, people said there's no way that a point-and-click type of game like this could ever work with a controller, and it's relatively smooth. Um, I'm stupid, so I don't get old Dungeons & Dragons, so after butting my head against it, this is probably my 10th, not, not an exaggeration. This is probably my 10th attempt to get into it, uh, over the past decade. And eventually this is the time when I just said, I'm done. I can't, I cannot concentrate on advanced dungeons and dragons rules anymore. I have to bump it down to easy mode and I don't feel good about it. I, I usually like to play games that are a little more challenging, but at this point, like a decade's gone by, I'm not making any headway into it. Advanced Dungeons and Dragons rules are for insane people. So whatever. And there's still a little bit of challenge to it because like, like all Dungeons and Dragons, um, character death can be permanent. And even with the permanent death turned off, if a, if a character dies in combat, there's still a bit of, um, there's there's still a punishment there because they drop all their stuff on the ground and you still have to lug them over to a temple to resurrect them, so whatever. But um, I just want to be done with it. I want to see it through to the end. I don't care anymore. <laughs> so that's what I'm doing there, and it's not quite as much stress relief as I thought it would be, but it's something to do right before I go to bed while I'm doing homework and all this other crap. Well, as someone who has been doing old school D and D for um, thirty five years now, um, mm -hmm. I am currently running three games a week. Uh, 
because of COVID. <clears throat> Most people, I went online and a lot of people were saying, well, we were gaming every week, but then COVID happens, we're not gaming. I'm one of those weird people, my game, the amount of gaming I was doing actually went up. <laughs> because I've got a bunch of friends who are at who are at home, they're working from home or they're quarantined, and they have they have internet uh, broadband, and they're like, "Hey, I heard you were still gaming. <laughs> Run a campaign for me." So I am currently running two campaigns, and then with my basic uh, usual weekly group, we are still meeting on Tuesday every Tuesday night as well. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of overwhelmed. I will point out, Chris, if you really want to. If you want to free up, I know you're in the middle of classes, though, too, so I don't know if this mm -hmm. will work for you. Uh, if you want to free up some time on a Tuesday night, a Thursday night, or a Saturday <laughs> afternoon, uh, I do have three gaming groups that are currently going. Oh, I, I wish that I could do that. That's one of the reasons why it's so hard for me to concentrate on, like, one single video game at the moment, because I'll turn it on for 10 minutes and say, okay, good, my, my serotonin is at a, a minimal level right now. It's time to go back to do other things. Uh, I'm kind of bad about that to begin with, where I'll be, where I'll say like, okay, I want to check in on this, I want to do this here, and okay, I'm I'm good now. And and now with classes, it's it's more a matter of necessity. Like, okay, I have to take ten minutes out to to free my head. Okay, now it's back to what I what I need to be doing. So I appreciate the offer and thank you very much. But at the moment, I, that's unfortunately a bit of too much of a time commitment for me because we've we've played before in the past and it is a good way to hang out and, and chill and and play a game for a few hours at a time yeah i wish that i had that time though what i'm kind of interested in though is how did as someone who's not in the scene as it were how how did people respond to what is now very easy access to to online resources like a tabletop simulator or or other kinds of tools that can be used now to re rather effortlessly play pen and paper games. Well, again, I can only speak for my particular gaming groups. I'm not, I don't really pay attention to what's going on on the national scene and stuff like that. Um, I s started up um, doing um, Skyping, basically doing internet gaming uh, probably about 10 years ago. One of my oh, wow. long-term players uh, moved from Wichita Falls to the Metroplex, and they are like, I still want a game. I go, well, that's going to be hard unless you want to drive up here every week. He goes, that's okay. And he was uh, he had a job as, a, uh, as an IT guy. He shows up at my house one day with, um, with uh, a webcam and cables, and he, he just goes, you stay right there. Just log into your laptop over here. I'll have everything set up. And Within within an hour, he's like, okay, you're all set up. All you have to do is push this when when it pops up. Turn on your TV, push it to here, push this button, and I will be gaming with you every Tuesday night from now on. I'm like, okay. Wow. I'm like That's perfectly awesome. fine with that. And it's now it's exclusive. I nobody comes to my house. No one's been in. Uh, no one has come to my house in almost uh, over six months now. It's all done through either Skype or Discord or. Um, well, that's the two that we're using right now. The other people have used other other um, web uh, conference type gaming and stuff like that and so forth. Um, now it depends on your group as well. There are some groups where they don't necessarily trust people to roll and they they're worried about cheating and stuff like that. That's the my groups. My groups, we, we you know we have fun even when we fail and stuff like that. So it's not that big a deal. But uh, I thought it was interesting because someone on one of the gaming bulletin boards I went to was doing a, a survey from people. And a lot of people saying, well, I used to game every week, but I'm not doing it anymore because of COVID. And I was one of the people saying, I'm gaming more because of COVID than I ever yeah. gamed before just because everyone's stuck at home. And they again, uh, my my Saturday game group is my youngest player and my oldest player. It's, it's <laughs> literally a guy I knew from junior high school and then someone who is literally half my age. Um, wow. So that's that's interesting. It's it's kind of crazy how it's almost like a universal language in itself. But I don't understand cheating, though. Like, unless you're playing a module specifically, I, I don't see why that would even be a concern. Well, there's, there's usually randomization in the game, and there are some people who view, still view it as, like, winning and losing the, yeah. the game and stuff like that. And so what they'll do is they'll 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 cheat at the randomization. They'll never have bad rolls, basically. And I've seen it several times with several different um, uh, players and stuff like that. It's just something that does happen. And I will say this: um, you were talking how it's universal. That yeah. is so weird to me. Um, 
I did a, uh, <laughs> and I'll bring this up again. I, I'm going to be doing probably a paper on uh, the history of Dungeons and Dragons at uh, ASAP this year. The American uh, American Studies Association of Texas is having a conference um, here on campus in February. And I hope to have um, John Schultz of the English department come on and talk about that a little bit. I actually sent him an email a while back, but he hasn't gotten back to me. Um, Dr. Schultz, please. That's going to be my new plea from now on for people we we would like we would like to talk to here. I'm just going to name them and say please. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but um, at that conference, I mentioned to a few of the other professors sheepishly that that I D and D. And again, I started D and Ding back in the early '80s. Okay, and it was mm -hmm. not something you broadcasted to people around you. If you did, you were you were literally. I mean, people go that wasn't real. Those 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 films, those old television shows. No, it was real. If you ran into a jock and he found you did D&D, he would beat the crap out of you and throw you into a locker. It was just something I, that happened back then. I absolutely hate that mindset of like, well, why are you doing this thing? It's not real. It's not like it, that that even started to happen with like video games for a bit when in at the end of I'd say around when I was in high school where people were starting to play video games more mainstream and it would and they would they still had that mindset of, but that's not real. Where they'd play games like Madden or like Call of Duty or something. Call of Duty was starting to get big uh, at the end of, of high school for me. But they'd say, why are you playing these other things when they're not real? Like, none of it's real. Nothing that you interact with that's fun, like, it usually doesn't have some basis in reality. People, like those same people were playing uh, fantasy football, and it's just D and D for football guys. It's literally just that. Well, to finish my thought, uh, basically, <laughs> I, I let these professors know I was doing it, and they thought it was the coolest thing ever. And I couldn't accept that. My mind was going, "This is a trick." Because most of the time, when I, before that, if I talked to a colleague about it, they'd look at me like kind of weird. Maybe they move a little bit f further away from me and stuff like that. Because there was a, um, a, a, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, there was a stigma. What? A sea change? Yeah, there has, yeah, there, there was a change, but there was, there was, you know, doing role playing games was viewed as something abnormal for a yes. long period of time. And the fact that, uh, again, it was weird because I was taken, it, I realized intellectually, yes, they actually are engaged. They think this is interesting. I mean, it's interesting enough. I'm actually probably going to do a paper, uh, like I said, do a lecture on it come February. But in my mind, I was waiting for the other uh, foot to drop. I was waiting for them to go, ha ha, you thought, you thought we liked the fact you were doing that. You're, you're a nerd. You're an idiot. Why are you doing this stuff? And it really kind of scarred me. As it, I was, it made me realize that it scarred me as a kid and the fact that I was, I was very hesitant to people let people know that I was into gaming and stuff like that. Anyway, but um, it's just and it's still that way for me. It still confuses the heck out of me when people say that is so cool because I'm I'm going. Why are you lying to me? Why are you saying it's so cool? It's not cool. It's terrible. I mean, so. Oh, that's not that's not the worst. I'm a I'm a deeply paranoid person. I have bad anxiety. I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop about working here. <laughs> I'm a I'm just waiting for. The yeah, I'm just waiting for the day where, where everyone's like, ha ha, we fooled you, your job was fake. And, you know, that's that's just me being insane. But I do have thoughts like that, too, where it's like, oh, these games, we, you know, they're, they're actually, everyone actually hates these and none of your interests are genuine. Yeah. Which is not rooted in reality at all. <laughs> that's just, that's just me. Uh, that's just me and my hangups. Well, this was something I thought we were going to talk with, with when Cody was on, but we didn't talk about it then. We talked about it now. Okay. It's interesting that, um, we, we kind of have, and this is, I feel like this is going to kind of shape the way our, our podcast runs, but yeah, we have, before we have guests on, we have an idea of what that conversation is going to turn out like. We have preconceived notions of, maybe what they're interested in talking about. And so far, almost entirely, we've been wrong. Yeah. Not, not that that's bad in the least. Not that I do, not that I dislike that. It's really interesting though, that it could be not what we're expecting. And it's, it's, it's fun. And it's really great to have that, that surprise almost. Yeah. I'm glad that we don't force them to st stay on, on script because, um, 
again, it's it's you can it's like a new discovery or something new happens that comes out of it that you weren't expecting. And sometimes that can be real magic. Now, sometimes we end up um, tripping over ourselves, but that's what editing is for. So we all sound perfect when we're done <laughs> by the end of the day. Um, but uh, yeah, I really enjoy the 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 not knowing where the conversation is going to take us. Yeah, me too. Although I do occasionally, I will have some questions that I do want to ask, but it's not a matter of of these are canned questions. It's more like this is something I want to know from this person. This is something I, I'm actually curious about, more so than just having like a scripted interview or something. I think that makes it uh, more interesting to listen to. And also, I think that's the reason we were picked to do this podcast too, because I think both of us are very interested in just learning more about people. Oh yeah, I I have um, I have dreams of of writing professionally and being a professional author, and that's one of the one of the biggest takeaways that I ever had from creative writing is just listen to people, just listen to how people talk, listen to how people think, and that's that's kind of what we're doing here, it just naturally, I'd say, or at least trying to at least, <laughs> we, yeah, we're trying to, I'm trying to specifically because I'm bad at, at understanding people. I think that's one of my bigger issues that I have as people have probably noticed. I'm bad about interrupting sometimes, and that's not me trying to be rude. That's just, uh, I'm bad at taking cues in conversation. Well, let's talk about this for a little bit. Um, cause we are kind of doing experimental stuff right here. I mean, we, we do want to go and interview some people, but we also want to have days like today where we're just we're, st we're just sitting around talking about random things in our lives and stuff like that. I'd like to keep that type of format where, we, again, we might find someone we want to interview or talk to them, but also I just have days where it's a little bit more fun, where it's a little bit more just to know, getting to, more, getting to know more about Ryan and Chris. Yeah, we are your hosts, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, that's a joke. <clears throat> I also, I'm also really horrible at getting humor across in case anyone hasn't been able to tell yet. So, well, we've gotten some good feedback about our humor. I don't necessarily find myself as funny either, but, um, people say we're hilarious. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> I, I don't see it. I've never tried to be funny in my life. Um, <laughs> well, I think we've just about exhausted all that we have today. It's been a very long week. It has been a long week. Again, we're trying. Again, we do these. We do these ahead of time, and we're trying to keep up with a daily schedule of getting a few in, uh, at least getting one in every week. I'm trying to build up a little bit of a backlog for Christmas. Uh, I know that you want to really want to get one out every single week. I will not come up here and record these with you um, like the day or after or before Christmas, just so you know, Chris. I so we're going to have to record a few more of them, I think, uh, in the upcoming weeks so that we have, that we have the enough to actually uh, put up over Christmas and stuff like that. I flat out refuse to do anything on days that we are off. Or not off, like, like, the weekend or whatever, but on our vacation, I desperately need this vacation this year. <laughs> uh, but that's a matter of, it's not really work here. You know, if you like what you do, then you don't work a day in your life. And that's, that's an approach that I have to this place. I, I don't feel like it's backbreaking, horrible labor. I actually have a lot of fun here. And this <laughs> podcast is just an extension of that. It's very fun for me. And we have tons of people that we've, that we've reached out to, uh, so we're not going to be um, bereft of, of, of guests in the next upcoming weeks and months. Oh, God, no. And if you would like to, if, you, if there's something, if you're on campus, or there's something that you'd really like to talk to us about or something that you'd like to like us to bring attention to, please, by all means, we'd love to have you on. However, we do have our new rule in place, and we will be enforcing it. If you want to talk about something. Or you want us to talk about something. Yeah. We would love to talk about it with you. Yeah. <laughs> I will also say that, again, we have tons of people that um, would uh, that we've reached out to. They've said, yes, they'd love to come on our show. So it might be a while before we get around to you, too. So just be aware of that fact. Um, yeah, that's that's very much true. It's it's going to be a little while. I, I'm frankly shocked at how many people have already said yes. Yeah. A lot of people say this is a great idea. I'd love to do it. So, you know. Well, 
I think that'll be about it for us this week. It's going to be a shorter episode, but that's not so bad. It also depends how much I cut out of it through editing. It might be a really short episode. It might be, <laughs> hi, I'm Ryan. Hi, I'm, I'm Chris. Well, thanks, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs> I'm waiting on that one. I'm, I you have a feeling that... first or something like that. Just do something like that where it's, just, it's literally <laughs> the entire the entire podcast is, is, is 20 seconds. That would be that would be <laughs> something. Uh, I have a feeling one of our more recent ones is going to be cut down about like that, too. But it is what it is. Yeah. Well, everyone, thank you for listening. Uh, again, if you have any comments, concerns, feedback, anything you want to you want to discuss with us, we'll be here. We're more than happy to talk with you. And hopefully see you next week. We will see you next week. Bye. <laughs>